Hello, welcome back. Um, this is going to be our first lesson. Um, the way we'll do this today is a little background on ENCODE. What is ENCODE, the Encyclopedia of DNA Elements? Um, what we're going to sort of, what sort of data we're going to look at, what's all in here. Um, and then we'll have a second short video on how to navigate the portal. Um, just some of the things we'll be looking for aspects of the data files, et cetera. Um, just the basic sort of overview, uh, quick overview of, of the um, database. Um, and then the third part will be, we will start our first um, R markdown file, um, 01 ENCODE. It's in the description of all of these videos um, and on, on the class wiki. Um, and what we'll do is we'll walk through what we would do to download data um, from ENCODE um, and start to analyze it. Um, no, we're not going to actually start to analyze it, but what, what would we do? What's an example of what it would look like to download some data, things we'd want to consider, and some very simple basic um, fundamentals of Bash that we'll use to, to do that. Um, so those will be three different parts, three different videos. Um, the goal of this video is to just give you some background of why did ENCODE happen? How did this all come to be? What was some sort of historical um, context? Um, so let's move forward with that part first. Um, so this is what the uh, portal is going to look like. We're going to use this uh, quite a bit in this um, in this uh, lecture. So, um, uh, but ENCODE let's go, if we take a step back, um, uh, started really because of the human genome. Re a, really, a foundational change happened when we started to think about having the human genome sequence. We could do a lot of different things um, once we had it. Um, and this really became the idea in 1990, um, where the National Institutes of Health, an interesting the Department of Energy was interested in sequencing the human genome, not for the sake of just sequencing it, um, which a lot of people were. It's like going to the moon or other heroic sort of efforts um, that have taken place. But they actually wanted to use human genome sequence to understand why certain regions um, were damaged by radiation um, as humans. For instance, UV light, other types of radiation that you'd be exposed to. Um, and this was a health risk concern um, to the Department of Energy. So they all teamed up and decided to fund this idea of building the human genome. We won't go into too much detail of what transpired, but it, about nine years later, um, the first human chromosome was sequenced. So we had the first genetic template of an entire chromosome, um, chromosome 22. Um, it's the smallest chromosome, probably the reason why it was done first. Makes sense. Um, and then shortly thereafter, um, the uh, draft of the human genome came out. This was really uh, a profound new way to think about doing biology is having the sequence as the template of of exploration rather than finding genes through phenotypes and other ways of doing science. We had the whole template um, to explore all the different types of regulatory elements. And, and of course, that was immediately what happened. I mean, the first and easiest sort of approach at the time was using microarray technology um, uh, that basically said there was lots of RNA um, transcribing the genome um, by um, two, two papers in 2002 uh, and three, there was sort of the microarray era of let's find new genes in the genome. Now that we have the entire sequence, a microarray allows you to put dots of DNA in a grid, sort of like you looked at Manhattan from an airplane, you would see a very logical system of streets and avenues. Um, and you, in the same way, could place pieces of DNA, hybridize RNA, and in the same analogy, think about a light in a building turns on. That means that gene is on or um, that window's open, et cetera. So you can know what person is, where there's a light on somewhere in New York City because you know the grid, you know the position. And when you look at what activity there is in a cell, it'll stick and glow um, like a light. Uh, so th that was one of the first approaches um, where we could unbiasedly survey the DNA sequence. And that was kind of a difference in the way you could approach science too, is once it was sequenced, you had the whole thing. So you could look at the whole thing. You didn't have to capture things like fishing, like throwing a lure in and catching something, and um, then finding what it is in the genome. Um, we could just use the whole um, sequence and look for things inside of it. Um, but this actually became an issue. <laughs> this is how ENCODE started. 
is there was becoming a massive amount of data being generated from all sorts of different labs. Everybody had access to the sequence. It was amazing time. But really what was starting to happen is people were like, none of this stuff overlaps. My data doesn't match with your data. And really people had never had to think about it at this scale, um, where when you look larger, and we'll get into this in later statistical lectures, but the more observations you can have, the more you really have to think about what you're finding um, and what could have been found by chance instead. And so quickly thereafter, it was really becoming clear that none of these results were matching, but look how many papers were coming out, 700, 6,000 for RNA. RNA was just easier um, to sort of sequence. <laughs> uh, and I think that's really why. Um, and so this was an issue. And, and so the National Institute of Health recognized this and we wanted to organize the funding. They wanted to organize the funding and everybody would uh, to make it more efficient. Let's work as a team, use the same techniques, let's make protocols and standards. And that's really where ENCODE came in is the explosion of the human genome opened up so many opportunities, so many new technologies, um, so many ways of looking at science. And really, they, within three years of the draft of it, it was time to start ENCODE or the Encyclopedia of DNA Elements um, that was going to organize this deluge of data. and fund projects as groups of scientists that will do things in a systematic and similar way. And I think that really, was a really insightful thing 17 years ago. Um, and now I just think understanding how this is so important, it's worth a course um, to organize data and think about its reproducibility and how you think about all that upfront so you can organize it so more people can use it. Um, and that was really the incentive um, for the NIH. It was how do we make data people will actually use? If this keeps happening where everybody makes different data and nobody can use it, none of it overlaps, how do we, how do we fix that? And how do we get people to work together um, through mechanistic ways and funding teams of science? And it was a really, really special and far ahead of its time, um, in my opinion. It progressed through three different phases. We'll summarize those in a minute. Um, the first phase was interesting because we knew that 5% of the genome was conserved and was probably therefore likely important. And that means conserved means that like if every animal has it, boy, it must be special DNA if everybody's keeping it. Um, so, uh, but they really, the technologies back then could only encapsulate about 1% of the genome um, with microarray technology. The first phase of ENCODE 1 was mostly microarrays. Um, uh, and they focused on this 1% of the genome, but half of a lot of large portion of that portion of that 1% was regions we already knew about um, that were probably important because they're conserved um, by sequence. And ENCODE 2, uh, sequencing had opened up. So now we could seek, seek, seek and get the whole picture. Instead of using a microarray, it's different. It's, it's interesting the different logic um, that when you use a microarray, you're you're putting the, the lures into the river or the net into the river, and you're deciding what pieces of the DNA, you're limited to the pieces of the DNA, you can see search. Um, with sequencing, you could just get all of the genome and then map it back to where uh, it came from. Um, so that was a really interesting perspective change. And I think it made the data much more useful. You'll see in the last slide, everybody started using ENCODE data right after this, this ENCODE 2 phase finished, where they saw the power of sequencing um, versus uh, sort of microarray technology. Personally, it's very unfortunate for me because it's actually the only thing I really know how to do well in the lab. And there's literally no point in doing it anymore. I don't, I don't think, um, I'm sure there is some reason, but uh, sequencing just became the thing. And now uh, 17 years since its inception in 2003, ENCODE 3 uh, was just published in Nature. Um, and it's a fabulous read. Um, we have the link to this uh, paper in the description. Um, and we'll go over a quick, a quick summary in the next couple of slides here. Um, of what ENCODE has done, and it's quite remarkable. So in the next video, we'll come to the portal, um, sort of look at how these findings have been organized in a web face, web interface that anybody can use and understand. Um, it, some of these words will seem scary, and they're, it's not as bad as it seems, and we'll walk through that in the next video um, of how to search this portal for, for data you might be interested in. Um, but 
for this class, we're going to be interested in one aspect of ENCODE. Um, it's a large aspect of ENCODE, probably perhaps one of the biggest, is DNA binding protein. So once we knew the template of the genome, all the sequences, people wanted to know, well, where are proteins binding there? Then we'll find new ways for regulatory logic. It's like sort of demapping a wire diagram for a circuit or something that if you know where all the the active and inactive um, components are and where they're landing in the DNA, you can understand new types of, or we can see the full picture, if you will, of how genome regulation is happening. Um, so for our interest in the course, we're gonna focus on DNA binding proteins, but a lot of this could be used in the same way in the different aspects of ENCODE data. And so what that sort of means is that proteins come together in specific pieces of DNA, oftentimes a promoter, where they'll organize each other, organize and come together in, um, into a party, if you will, at the promoter and turn on transcription of the gene or turn it off. Um, and different combinations can do different things. Um, and that's the goal of this class is to look in one cell that has the same DNA. How do hundreds of proteins organize themselves? What are their sort of choreography? How do they, which groups hang out together, which ones don't, um, and what sort of things um, transpire. So the way the method we're going to look at is CHIP or chromatin immunoprecipitation, where you have a, you know, cells growing in a dish and you add um, what's called a cross-linking reagent um, or formaldehyde. And what this does is it's like taking a picture of the cell. It snap freezes them, uh, the proteins in place and um, you get sort of a picture of the cell in action. Um, and every cell could be in a little bit of a different position. Um, so that's something to remember, but a little bit too technical for, for right now. We'll get into that stuff much later. Um, but for the simplistic part of it, it's really, it, it's really profound what you can find out where you can see the whole genome-wide view of where a protein is bound and where it is not bound. And how you do that is you break these pieces up because they've been crossed together, taking a picture of, so they're frozen in time, and then you see you get pieces of them. Um, and what little piece of DNA instead of all the DNA, you get just the pieces that they're bound to. Um, and you can do that by saying, using an antibody to your favorite protein. Um, recently, we've heard a lot about antibody uh, cocktails and things. And what these antibodies do is they recognize specific proteins. Um, and these are the proteins we know and are in the cell that bind the DNA. Um, so we can find out all the pieces of DNA they bind to um, versus those that are not their normal binding sites. Um, and as a control, you can just use total um, DNA. Uh, this use the same process rather, um, but just not adding the antibody in. Um, and then that way, you get you're using the same experimental setup where you're changing paths here. Is you're just saying what DNA do I get by chance? Like if I just did wanted random DNA, I'd expect pretty even amount of it all over the genome because it should just be sort of evenly spread out. Um, and then you can ask in where you precipitated or used the antibody to get your protein. You can ask, did I get, what regions sort of spike with um, information here? Where did I get parts of the genome? Way more than just by random um, in this second path here. So um, that's kind of just the basics. We're gonna get into this a lot more, but I thought it's worth it when we start to look at what we're gonna be finding from ENCODE. Just the basics, don't worry, we're, we'll talk about this much more. Um, and so what this data would sort of look like is here's an example of an experimental tract in red where we have the antibody and in blue where we don't have the antibody. So the blue would be the DNA that just comes down in this experiment by random. Um, and what we see in the red picture here is there is a bump in the input here where it's not specific. And there's this peak there, it looks pretty good, but the computer was smart enough to say, hey, I think there's too much uh, input DNA here. This peak could be called by accident. Let's, let's not um, confirm it yet. And so this one where you can see there's a decrease now in the input is saying, hey, there's, there seems to be a real peak here. And this is an even more clear example where when we use the antibody to get a specific protein, 
we should see the enrichment of its binding at specific sites over a range of gene bank here in blue. And that's exactly what you see. Um, and often these are called tracks, if you will. The y-axis is the average number of reads usually in a log scale. Um, and uh, you'll have annotations of genes down here in gray. And these blue boxes are saying, here's where the computer said there's something real versus something not. So a couple of key terms here is input control um, and IP, immunoprecipitation or chip um, or chromatin immunoprecipitation. Um, so this is the basics of what you get out of ENCODE, but it's all regulated in, in very small experimental conditions. So you understand that ENCODE has already kind of verified that this data is sound um, and experiments are sound. That's even more, just as important as the data is that the experiments are done in very similar ways or ways that are very well marked down. There were still problems even a decade later where this was all great. You could see um, in this previous slide where we could say, oh, there's more DNA here. This is the spot where this protein binds. Well, it turns out if you look at the entire data set, and this is where some of those intuitive statistics will come in later in the class, is that if you saw more data outside the regions you said were important than inside the regions you said were important, that might be a little concerning. Um, and that was the case. Uh, here's an example of these tracks again of, of two different types of chip where you're basically just finding where the DNA binding protein is bound because it'll have more DNA underneath it than random DNA shown here in this bottom track. So, uh, you can see three peaks here, very well called. These, again, are different genes in the genome down here. It gives you a little perspective of where they're binding. Um, but this looks all fine and dandy, except for that only 10% of the reads in these peak regions were from these peaks, and the rest of the data was outside or unalignable. Um, so there was a, a quality control metric that needed to be saying that, well, uh, imagine it this way. I, there's a story I'm going to tell you, but I'm only going to tell you 10% of the story, and then you have to figure out the rest of the story. That's going to be a really complicated story to understand. And so what you really would want is somebody who tells you 100% of the story. And sometimes that's not the case. You skip words when you're reading a book to a child or whatever, and you miss little bits here and there, but that's not so bad. They get the main point of the story. But if you were to only read every 10th page or every 10th word, they're not going to understand what you're saying. Um, so that was kind of another nice reality check um, by the ENCODE team led by uh, Michael Snyder and Barbara Wool, Jason Lee, Peg Barnum, Kim White. We look at this list of authors and they say it's really the who's who is thinking about um, genomic data at the time. So what did ENCODE find in the end? And then we'll summarize and then let's go look at ENCODE data uh, quickly uh, or pretty soon here. Um, okay, so in phase one where they looked at 1% of the genome, um, based the main finding from many labs and um, is an interest of, of our labs uh, is uh, that there's lots of RNA. There's RNA all over the genome. What it means is a different question. Um, and that's what, you know, it's going to take experiments and, and a lot of work. But what was surprising is the 5% of the genome that's highly conserved, as we were saying, or the important part of the genome made RNA, but so did a lot more. In fact, more um, than that 5% was, was making RNA. So I think that was the first conclusion. And phase two proceeded a lot with that same how many genes are there in the genome question? If you see RNA, is it a gene? It became confusing and blurry, and we'll get into aspects of that later. But for now, I think it's a nice way to think of how much ENCODE did do by saying, let's look for RNA, let's try to find genes, and let's say how many genes there are, and give you the answer, and the, or their answer in a minute. But phase two was bold in saying that 80% of the human genome is transcribed. Most mutations in disease come from not the 5% focused on in phase one. Um, and there was a code of histones that could tell you whether a region was one type of piece of DNA or another. And this is the, the packaging material of DNA can have different ornaments on it, if you will, or modifications. And those modifications are very telling of what type of DNA, if it's on, if it's on or active DNA or if it's off. 
Um, and at, at, as you'll see in the next slide, that this is where ENCODE really started showing um, how powerful these resources were. They, they not only build big resource maps, but figured out ways to do it in certain cell lines, in optimizations of the techniques, and how to disseminate the data for the first time really well. Um, uh, it's amazing now, but what the phase two data did is really put it in the hands of the general uh, public, and that was the goal. And uh, there's a great plot showing that from the ENCODE authors. Um, and phase three is a massive scale up, adding new techniques that were an experimental uh, of development, if you were research and development, if you will, in phase two that um, became really important, like high C, for instance, how the genome is folded in three dimensions, um, and more and more um, chip data that we're going to be looking at. Um, how to validate these antibodies and make sure they're binding to the right proteins. How do you make sure the data is good quality, et cetera, et cetera. And we'll go through um, that as throughout the class. Um, and so here's some final answers, and then we'll get to playing with the genome. Um, the in ENCODE in phase three that just came out in Nature in 2020, um, there's 20,225 protein coding genes and 37,505. 95 non coding genes. We'll go into that later. Um, but basically, it means that the way we classically thought about biology is DNA made RNA to make protein. And there's about 37,000 of those intermediate RNAs that are not making protein that are doing something as an RNA, supposedly. And then that takes a lot of experimental work. But it's still important to have a map of where these things are. Um, so that's nice that, they, that they, we have this. Um, and 2,157,387 open chromatin regions. Well, that's important because open chromatin means open DNA, and that means a protein can go in there. Um, we'll get into that again later. We really won't be looking at this data too much. But there's a way to just say what's open in the genome, who's open. Um, and if they're open, what that means is there's somebody there. Um, and they're active, and they're, or not active, but it means that some protein is binding there. Um, it was accessible DNA to be bound to. Um, 1,224,154 DNA binding regions, that's what we're gonna do. Uh, in this class, this year, it's hep G2, but this is what we're gonna dig into and see who's binding where in the DNA. And that's kind of the fun part of this class is looking at a lot of different proteins I think of it as a, an orchestra of proteins and how do they work together to make up a given cell's um, transcriptome or output or identity, if you will. Um, uh, 845,000 RNA binding regions. Another important part of biology is where not only where proteins bind to DNA in the genome, but where do they bind on the RNA and ENCODE map that out too. So that's another huge resource. By the end of the class, we're going to start to think about all these resources and how we can integrate them together. Um, and so, and then we've mentioned this three dimensional, how the genome folds into three dimensions, and there's over 130,000 long range interactions in the DNA um, uh, in ENCODE's uh, release. And the great thing about all these numbers are huge and sounds really scary. Um, but ENCODE did a great job of making them very easily available. And that's what we'll I'll give a quick intro into and then we'll go actually do. So this is just the more of what I just showed you that's expansion through years of ENCODE, just pumping out really high quality data. This is horribly confusing. Do not feel like you have to understand the second half of this slide here, but by the end of the class, you will. And these tracks on the bottom are where we saw regions of different DNA binding proteins binding different regions and how they might be interacting. In this case, it's a B cell, gene annotations, red and green bars, it all looks super confusing. But by the end of this, you start to see how the, you can see where activity is in the genome um, by using these sort of plots. So by the end of the course, we'll, you, you will have a, be very comfortable with these. But this is what ENCODE is so great, is it's, it's literally the encyclopedia of DNA elements. So encyclopedias are not easy to read takes time to figure out how to do that, and but, but that's what we're going to do here, is figure out what are each of these DNA elements and how are they in like, how do they fit in the encyclopedia. So this is the slide I was mentioning that ENCODE here in blue has been publishing quite a bit of their data as they should, and they're really impressive data sets, but 
what's more important is a spike in users um, that you want more users. You want to invest in time and get more users um, in the end because your people understand your data quality is um, getting high. And so that change around 2013 was the pivot point. And that's where we mentioned, I mentioned that the sequencing phase of ENCODE phase two has finished. Um, they've moved on to mouse and other organisms, which we'll see. And again, this all looks complicated um, and you don't need to worry about it, but it all ends up kind of end up looking like this um, or meta plots of this kind of data. If we have this template of DNA, if we can figure out where the regulatory elements are, um, and that's kind of what, how they introduce the, the browser here, if we can find out how these relevant elements are, where all these elements are and how they coordinate with each other, um, that's going to take a lot of time. That's going to be a very hard challenge, but we can do it all using the same kind of data that has been tested um, through lots of different labs to see what the, the pros and cons of each type of data are. So now we're going to sign off from here and go to the next video where we're going to actually start to look at uh, how we're going to start to get data tables to download a th thousands of data sets from from this website very easily. I think the next video should be quite short. Um, and uh, we're gonna go through and pick the things we're gonna look for and start with downloading the first uh, class data file of, of samples we're gonna analyze by the end of the class. All right, well, thanks for now and uh, hope to see you in the next video.